So let me ask, uh, this is a question that also uh, comes up commonly in, in, in my world uh, from community docs, this whole issue of pseudo progression. We haven't talked I, about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, <that's> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't believe that it happens that frequently in lung cancer. Uh, the, the docs that I, I, I recently spoke to a couple of them a day or two ago and and what they said is that, you know, they believe in immunotherapy and they kind of said that we're, we're kind of hanging on with these, you know, people that look worse, but, we, you know, we hear a lot about this pseudo progression. How long should we hang on? So, um, so your I've thoughts? I've seen some disturbing um, uh, cases in, in my consultation practice around this. So this, you brought up duration of response, right? Yes. This whole pseudo progression. Duration of therapy. Duration of therapy, right? Yeah. There were people on the phase one of uh, IPI and melanoma that came off were put on hospice yeah. um, and are still alive and thriving today, yeah. right? That got a dose or two. Yeah. Um, that illustrates both uh, the pseudo progression issue in melanoma, mm -hmm. um, as well as the duration of therapy issue uh, uh, you were raising. So this whole idea is that um, certainly in melanoma, it's seen patients that the cancer seems to be growing, perhaps due to immune infiltration, and then later wonderful things happen. How does this translate to lung cancer? If you uh, count patients in the spider plots. And I actually queried the major companies to try to do a pooled analysis of this, and no one gave me data. But if you go counting one by one um, the spider plots in the major published studies, it's very hard to actually find clear pseudo progressors yeah, uh, yeah. in lung cancer. Same for head and neck, by the way. It's probably maybe 5% of apparent progression I don't think that is pseudo progression. Yeah. No, of apparent okay. progression, not yeah, yeah, total yeah. patient. Okay, okay. Right. Right. So, right. okay. so what I'm seeing yeah. in, my, in my consultative practice is that we've gone back to, to decades ago where no one believed progression exists, yeah. right? That because, you know, that, that you're holding on to a drug, um, uh, and, and this is hurting people, right? People get yeah. sicker as yeah. you watch them progress. Um, it's a big problem. So I think the lesson in lung cancer is that if you see uh, what appears to be progressive disease. Unless the patient is feeling much, much better and there's nothing scary about it and everything lines up, that they're, they're, it's not central disease, it's not rapidly growing, the patient says they feel better, right? All the stars align, okay, you can go another cycle or two and try. But yeah. if everything isn't perfectly aligned, I think the right thing to do in clinical practice is rather simple. Yeah. Stop and move on to the next line. Yeah. But this is a concept that has reached the patients and that's and they want yeah. to stick with the They treatment. want to believe, feeling, they want They're feeling control. well, this was the miracle so we. that they wanted and it's not working. And in the second line setting, I was a little bit more willing to go along with it because getting them to the next line of cytotoxic chemotherapy wasn't any great shakes either. First line. But in the first difference. line, yeah. it's really doing patients a disservice if you allow them to progress on their immunotherapy and you don't get them to that first line chemotherapy. I, I always thought it was very biased, and this will take us back 15 years, um, where, you know, you remember when investigators would report, you know, minor responses, yeah. right? <laughs> Because, you know, you use resist and it's got to be 30%. If it doesn't hit 30%, it's a minor response. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, but, you know, now we call it disease control or stable disease. There were never minor progressions. You know, I mean, you know, you read that on a. Well, there a, were, a, but yeah, we exactly. You read it on a, right. Nobody ever talked about that. And that's, yeah. you know, I tell them it's between less than 30% and to 20%. So 19 yeah. to 29 is stable disease. And yeah. you know, you might have a radiology report, and I think this is where it really gets people confused. It says progression on a scan. You got a, a community general oncologist who pulls that up, oh, it's progression. You know, and I totally agree. It's the patient. If they're feeling mm -hmm. better or not worse, I really put less value on that scan, regardless of what therapy they are. They could be on a cytotoxic chemotherapy, they could be on you know, an EGFR drug or immunotherapy. And, and I agree, everyone made a big deal about pseudoprogression and whoever published the first sort of case report got some press about that. But Sure, changing the rules always makes more yeah. press. Right. Right. Saying, Wait, the rules are the same. That's right, but uh, you know, I, I've never seen it. Uh, yeah. I don't think any of my colleagues have seen it. Maybe it was one case among us. It does exist, but I don't think we would be able to, you yeah. know, put them out on the table here and you know get a big collection. Yeah, and I, I think we need to remind ourselves that we can't draw lines across diseases as easily as we'd like to. And I, I think you mentioned that it's gotten to the patients. They heard from the melanoma world that this is real. And, and this is not just for immunotherapy. This holds for all the targeted therapies too. The experience with BRAF in melanoma versus colon cancer, very different. And so we, we have to make sure we don't fool ourselves into thinking that every time we find a miracle, it's gonna be a miracle for everybody that shares those characteristics.